Hi, my name is uh, Douglas Vode. I am the publisher of Vector Associates. And uh, uh, after 30 plus years, I finally got my friend, Abelard Reichlin, to do an interview of his infamous or famous book called The True Authorship of the New Testament. Some of you may have seen it advertised in Nation, New Republic, etc., where it says, Flavius Josephus writes New Testament. Well, uh, he's the first one in history that openly wrote about it and figured out the whole family relationship of who wrote the New Testament, when the books were written, the code systems that the Pisos used in writing it. So if you're a theologian, amateur professional, uh, regardless whether you're uh, Catholic, Protestant, Baptist, uh, Jewish, or even if you're Muslim and curious about uh, this whole story, you're going to love this. This is a real treat. You're going to learn more about not only Roman history, but the code systems and, and how it was written and the proof that Abelard is right and everybody else is wrong. So I've got a couple of questions for him. And what you see up, uh, above us here is the family tree that we'll partially go through so you understand the relationship of who wrote what, how the books were written, the years they started, and how it progressed. Because uh, that's a big mystery for many scholars is, is how the books were written, when they were, and stuff like that. So, um, Abelard, thank you for taking my invitation and finally doing this. Uh, first question. Um, uh, what came you about? Why did you decide to write this? Or how did you get curious about the New Testament? Many, many people are curious about the New Testament. They can't understand why a small group of supposedly persecuted Christians could persevere in the catacombs for 35 years hiding from the Roman legionaries who supposedly are trying to find and kill them. And the legionaries knew the catacombs far better than did these poor, straggling, uneducated Christians. For sure. And it's a mystery. Where were they for 35 years and how did they come out of the catacombs well and alive after 35 years with great new leaders that nobody had ever heard of before? Where did the Christians come from? How did they escape the legionaries and the catacombs for 35 years? That's how I got onto it. I was an attorney for over 50 years, but like many people want to become an attorney and they don't make it, I made it to become an attorney and I always wanted to become a detective. Well, I read Agatha Christie, I read Sherlock Holmes, and then I got onto the New Testament because I was so curious about how did they manage to hide for 35 years in the catacombs? <laughs> the, uh, I want to also say, explain one thing. The reason why we're not showing his face, he's going to be famous one day, really famous. But he doesn't want to be that famous right now because <laughs> the subject is sensitive to a lot of people and it affects two of the world's great religions. So you're going to see his lovely head in the back of his head and, uh, uh, but to give you an idea, he's been selling this book, or we have also since 79, I think it was, right, when we first published 1981, it. 1981, finally. Well, that's when you finally decided to bring it public, right, right. instead of just trying to get the rabbis to accept it. But because my Jewish friends were just too, too stubborn. Too stubborn and too afraid to get involved with Christianity because they had, had so many problems of being persecuted, hated, treated with contempt, and finally murdered in mass in Catholic Europe and in Russia and in Poland. And they didn't want any part of this. No question. But, uh, uh, but over the years, if you search on the internet, uh, if you search for just Arius Calpurnius Piso, the star of this story, you'll find 335 web pages that have the name listed. For Abelard Reichlin, which is him, 3080 mention him, which means they're talking about the true authorship. And when you search for the true authorship of the New Testament, with quotes around it, of course, 
We got 967. That's how many web pages or, or news groups have people talking about the book. Some have estimated that as many as a million people worldwide know about the pesos, and it's all because of him and and releasing this information to the world. So, uh, let me see. My first question, I think, for you is, um, well, the family tree. Let's get to the first thing. Uh, who was the first one who came up with the idea of a Jesus Savior? The one who came up with the idea of a Savior for the Judeans, as the Jews were then called, was T. Flavius Sabinus, who was the head Son. of the Flavian family who lived in Etrusca, which was Etruria, which was northwest of the city of Rome. And their leader was T. Flavius Sabinus. Sabinus was because it was near the Sabine River. Flavius was because it was gold and they liked that for their name. T. Flavius Sabinus. He wrote, not much, but he wrote a small compendium of Roman history under the name, his literary name of Valeus Paterculus. And he was the one who came up with the idea and gave it to his son, who happened to be married to Arachina Sr., or Arius Sr., who turns out to be the link between the two families. Yeah, we have two families here. We have, well, the father was Valeus Paterculus. He's the one who gave the idea to his son, Valeus, uh, the son, uh, Sabinus. The other son became Vespasian, the emperor, and, and died in 96. No, in uh, 81. Died in 81? His son, Domitian, his son and last successor, died in 96. Oh, got it. Okay. So, when did he take, when did he take power? He took power in 79. So, he was there for two years. So he was only there for two years. Maybe but his son, Titus, bit. ruled with him, and Titus lived until the year, uh, he took, excuse me, 69 he took over, not 79. He took over in 69. Oh, 69, okay. And Titus ruled till 79 when supposedly he ate some poisoned boiled fish, perhaps uh, supplied uh, intentionally or unintentionally by his brother Domitian. And Domitian took over and ruled until 96. That was the end yeah. of the Flavian dynasty. So, and the, the important part of here is also his wife was Arya Sr. And their daughter, Arya Jr., winds up marrying of the great one. Well, uh, the father of Arius, Gaius C. Calpurnius Piso, right. also known as Reyes Paetus. His wife is Arya Jr., and there's an interesting story about that we'll get to later with, with the um, emperor. Um, okay, we'll stop at this point and we'll go on to this after these, these other questions. Um, who did the story pass through that eventually ended up as the current version of the bookmark? The bookmark is evidently the first one and evidently the most difficult to figure out. It is because it had so many different authors adding things to it. So we have him given the idea to his son who writes the earliest version, but it doesn't have a lot of the names in it yet. No. It's, it's just a, it's just a uh, basically just a sketch. Then his his son-in-law, Gaius C. Piso, takes over and finishes Urmarcus. Now, the reason why it's Urmarcus is why. From Sabinus's name, Furius was a, was a noble name in Roman history of a great conqueror, and he was one of those who used the name Furius. It meant ferocious, and it also meant, uh, uh, from the German, it supposedly meant original. But actually, it was a name that ties together the Pisos for a number of generations, including the fact that uh, eventually the fictional uh, King Arthur has a, a, a fictional father who is named uh, Furius Pendragon. So Furius was a great, great, honorable name. So all they did was the so all they did was chop off the F and tell the I chop off the suffix. That's right. And they had Ur Marcus. Ur from. So he's giving credit to, to Flavius Sabinus for developing it further than Paterculus. That's right. And basically it. 
So basically, there's like four different authors to this, Mark. That's so, why it's so complicated. It's the hardest book to figure out. So we have the father, Gaius Calpurnius Piso, his wife, Aria Jr. At this point, I wanted to say in, in the book, Mark, it doesn't talk about a virgin birth at all. That was developed later. In, in chapter 1, verse 11, it, it then says, And there came a voice from heaven, saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now that happens after John the Baptist baptizes him. But uh, the reason why they use that as a son is because they were plagiarizing right from uh, Ezekiel, where in, I think, chapter 41 or 42, there's a prince who sits in front of, um, with God, and a prince is obviously the son of a king, and that's where they borrowed it from. And later, in chapter 6, verse 3, it then winds up saying, is not the carpenter the son of Mary? They finally introduce the name Mary, which means Gaius must have written from that section on, but explain why he uses Mary. They used Mary, which was a... Later, it was the name Mary. They used the name Mariam, M-A-R-I-A-M, because uh, they wanted to create a tie-in with uh, Moses' mother, Miriam. But they changed the I to an A, because Piso was playing the game that he was the mother as well as the father, like the like the rhyme in uh, in one of the Shakespearean plays. Uh, which speaks of I'm my mother, father, and yet his child, etc., etc., etc. One man playing many parts on the stage of life. Of the sh- parts on the stage of life. Of the Shakespearean writing. Uh, uh, I like to add one, th- one thing. In the booklet, when you buy it, I- if you buy it, on page seven, there's the code system uh, that he uses, the pieces use, or Greek large numbering, small numbering, and the sequence system. In the in large numbering, the reason why he chose Mariam is he adds an M in the front and the M in the back of his mother's real name. And so we have Piso, the first letter of Piso is Pi, and Pi was equal to 80 in Greek large numbering. So in essence, he's saying it's him. He's The M and M is 80, so it's Aria Piso, or feminine version of his own name, Arius Piso. That's right. He's saying that I am the mother as well as the father. He's, he's everything. I'm on either end with the feminine form of my name of Arius in the middle is Aria. M plus Aria plus M is, means feminine myself plus 80. 40 and 40. She's 80. Now, the virgin birth, we have to say it because it ties out with this guy. Gaius Caligula, the emperor, the degenerate emperor. Uh, I had found it in, it's in your second book, your larger book, the reference. He, uh, on Gaius Calpurnius Piso's wedding night with Aria Jr., what does he do? According to Roman history, I'm not sure where I got it from. Uh, I, someplace. The I reference is from, there, I got it. Suetonius, I believe. Is that right? Is that right? You talk, I'll get it. All right. Go ahead. You give the explanation. I'm going to find it. Antonius was Piso's grandson. He took the name from the general Suetonius who conquered Boethia in the 100 years prior, prior, prior to this time. And uh, in that battle, Suetonius Paulinus was a Roman general, so he was honored with the fictional name of Suetonius. But he wasn't a, really that much of a military man. He was a great writer. He became the Emperor Antoninus in 138 and then wrote up to his time a compendium of Gnostic literature and he gave it the name Gnostic literature. And uh, so we have uh, from Suetonius Gnostic literature and we also have from him the lives of the twelve Caesars. up to just before the time of uh, of uh, the taking of power to this of Vespasian, and he posits the rule, which uh, the the information which Doug will tell you about that. And it, it's really a, a very you 
humorous thing. I, I don't want to treat this too humorously, although Piso had a fantastic sense of humor. He, he was basically sticking his finger in the, in the Roman aristocracy. They all knew this, that his real father was uh, Gaius Caligula. It must be in the later section. I, I can't find it, but I know it's in here. I found it earlier. Uh, that was the Deep Dark family secret. Now, the other part of Caligula is... was possibly uh, illegitimate. Well, the, the beauty of the whole... To flaunt the, Ro the Roman aristocracy yeah. back. The, the Say, look, I'm entitled to be emperor. My father, is, my father was Caligula. And everybody knows it. And everybody's <laughs> teaching me about it. So well, the, well, the, 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 the heck with them. The, I'm, I'm going to flaunt it back. So the other part of this thing is this. Uh, he was such a degenerate, he, he forced the Roman ar aristocracy to worship him as a god. So by, by Piso putting in there that God is the father, marries the mother. He's really talking about his own life. Aria, Mariam, is his mother. And everybody had assumed he was, the, was God, or had to worship him as a god. So basically, the Roman god is his father, Gaius Caligula, and that's his mother. And he's the offspring. So it was not a virgin birth, obviously. Uh, but a Roman god, uh, Gaius Caligula, was his real father, his real paternal father. That's the scandal that the Roman aristocracy knew about, because he must have had her for over a month after the wedding, and got her pregnant, and six months later, he's born in 37. Yes, it was nine months, about nine months after the wedding. Yeah. So we know who the father is. <laughs> There's no question about it. So, and, and that's the joke. And that's maybe why they got to get out, you know, figured his sons were in line to be emperors because Gaius Caligula was the emperor. Okay, I'll go on. Um, okay, who's the main designer of the, the NT? Who's the guy who put it together after the father got done with it? Fabius Justus took over his, all of his other brothers. The four of them. Well, I think we're yeah. jumping ahead. I'm really talking about Arius Calpurnius Piso. He's the guy who really was the designer he and was organizer. The director. He was everything. Two books had not been finished by the time he died in 118. They were Romans, the Epistles of the Romans, and they were also they also consisted of uh, the um, uh, the Book of Hebrews. They were written by his sons after his death, but everything else had been finished. Even the letters had been finished. He and his son, his grandson Arian, collaborated mm -hmm. under other names, which we didn't correct in the booklets. But they're they're by largely by Piso and Arian. But there are five or six of these small letters at the end of the New Testament. They're also by Piso, but Piso, with the help of his Arian, of his son, a grandson Arian, whom he was training to be his successor in a literary sense on the Christian writings. What were some of the other pen names? The, the world knows him as Flavius Josephus. Yeah, That's the most known. Flavius Josephus. But he, was, he never lived as Josephus. This is Winston's translations. So that book by, by Wh Winston. By Winston is the yeah. famous book of the writings of Josephus. There is another. Uh, there is another series which we advise you to get if you can afford it or read them in the library. Ordered them by interlibrary loan. Those are, I think, 11 volumes now, and they sell for $20, $22, perhaps less. The Loeb's? The Loeb Classical, Li Classical Library, editions of Josephus. Um, they have a lot of uh, information in there, and they have the Greek on one side and the English on the other. They're easier to understand, but it takes scholarly work because it's not a quick read. By the way, that's how most of the uh, pastors and others get into the inner circle. They're curious about it. They start reading Josephus. The first mention of Jesus is, is, is in his testimony of Flavianum because he's the guy who wrote it. <laughs> That's why it's there. But uh, <laughs> anyway, um, so that was one of the pen names. What are some of the others of Piso? Titius Aristo. He, that was his name. These names appear in the writings of his much younger half-brother, who is also his granddaughter's husband, Pliny the Younger. He was finally admitted to the group and he, they allowed him to write. Half-brother. Uh, yeah, that's right, his much younger half-brother. Um, yeah. 
Titius Aristo is a Roman jurist. Uh, Plutarch. He wrote as Plutarch, of course, the moralist. Uh, That's a joke by itself. Great, great writer. Uh, he was also Titinius Capito, a philosopher. Uh, he wrote as Nicomachus of Gerasa, a uh, Pythagorean mathematician. He also was the general at the siege of, of, of the, Masada. As, under what name? Uh, Flavius <laughs> Silva. Flavius again comes back. Now he's Flavius, uh, Flavius Silva. He this is why. Because he relates to the Flavians. And he forces the suicide, if it happened, of the, uh, of the zealots defending the mountaintop of uh, Masada before the Romans would break in after, in the morning and slaughter them all, torture them and slaughter them. Supposedly they committed suicide. 960 people, he said. Right, it's Romans a never bothered to count the bodies of their victims. They just shoveled them into the pit and covered them over and celebrated and got drunk. They didn't care about that. This time they counted the bodies, 960. Why? Made up of? Because 300 was T, which stood for Christianity. The cross. 600 was, 600 was the first letter of Christos, Chai. In large numbering. That's right. And... Um, and, six, and uh, 60 was the name Calpurnius Piso in small numbering. 41 Calpurnius. was the total of the name Calpurnius, that's right. 19 was the total of the name Piso. It was Piso, Cal, Calpurnius Piso, and, uh, and Christianity, and, uh, and uh, the total was 960. There were also, according to Josephus himself, Seven people who didn't get killed by by uh, by suicide. Two women and five children in hiding. That made the total 967. But 67 was Piso too. If you try the the sequence system, the letters of Piso in sequence in their alpha, in the uh, Greek alphabet, total total 67. That's why there are 967 actually. Much later. The predecessor to, to the story of King Arthur, written by the popes, the sequence, various chapters written by the popes, um, this was a writing of, uh, uh, of a, uh, of a, uh, of a uh, early church father who wrote under, under the name of uh, um, a Danish writer who wrote of the, uh, the name escapes me now, but it's an early version of the King Arthur stories. And he single-handedly repels the invading Saxons. Guess how many he slew single-handedly? Go for it. <laughs> to defend Rome, to defend Britain against the invasion by Saxons? You'll never guess. 960. Where did he get 960? Leave that to your imagination. But there were 960. One man slew and defeated the invading Saxons. Well, at this point, since we're dealing with numbers and stuff like that, uh, his his eldest surviving son, he had an older son, Alexander, who evidently died in Judea earlier. No, I think he died in Asiatic Turkey. Same place. I mean, same area. Yeah. The, uh, the description of it and stuff like that is in Plutarch, where he comforts his wife. But anyway... Uh, Julius is the one who wrote Revelation, and you're going to now know who Satan is. And this is his son. We'll explain it a little later. Well, why don't we do it now? Let's why it now. Plutarch, where he comforts his wife? But anyway, uh, Julius is the one who wrote Revelation, and you're going to now know who Satan is. And this is his son. We'll explain it a little later. Well, why don't we do it now? Let's why? It now. Why? Why? Revelation was even written, why and who 666 is. Why go for continue it. continue the suspense? Right, go for it. Go for it. Okay. He wrote, he wrote uh, Revelation, and he also Years. I figured out, but this is not in the booklet. This is since the time of the booklet. He also wrote the Gospel of Judas, uh, because he didn't like the family. His, he was mad. His family, had, his son had conquered... Uh, Bar Kokhba destroyed the Jews in the third and final Roman provoked revolt. He was a general. He was a gen. His son was a general. Also was the name uh, with the name of uh, Julius Severus, and uh, he uh, he came back to Rome, and they thought he would treat him to uh, being part of the ruling class. 
uh, in the emperor, vice emperor. No, they didn't. Justice had things under his thumb. He didn't trust any of his brothers. And not only that, but uh, but uh, he knew Julius uh, Justice was scheming for total power. Well, he was the oldest son. And he was the oldest son. And, yeah. and as you as you've pointed out to me, amongst the Romans, presumably the oldest son would get the would get the power. Sure. You know, so Fabius Justice uh, put him on trial for writing Revelation because the, he had mocked the family so much in Revelation. Mm -hmm. That's why there's so many strange things in Revelation. He's mocking his own family. They didn't. Con they didn't contain uh, um, revelation in the New Testament canon for perhaps fifty years after that, because they weren't sure whether to put it in, whether it was safe. They finally did, but uh, Fabius Justus survived. He was always loyal to his family. Um, his other two brothers died because of what he did, and uh, okay, and well, he left six sixty six, or else I'm going to say it. Six sixty six. Go ahead. Okay. After he, after his his younger brother Fabius Justus screws his, screws him out of having his son become emperor after Hadrian, he winds up uh, making Pliny the younger, who's who's now deceased already, who was deceased by then. Uh, he makes him the the twenty seven horned beast coming out of the water. Oh, sure. Yeah. Revelation. Uh, uh, he's the 144,000 that survives. 100 is KP, Calpurnius Piso. K is 20, P is 80. 100. 44 is Fabius Justus in Greek small numbering. So, yes, it's true. He did survive after this. Uh, the father is Satan. And this is how the first letter of Christos is 600 uh, in, in, Greek large, in Greek large numbering. But what's 66? Flavius Josephus, Flavius is 30, Josephus is 36 in Greek small numbering, together 66. In the Greek manuscripts it's 616, 616, same thing, uh, 600 is Christos, and 16th letter of the Greek alphabet is P, Pi for Piso, so it's daddy and his creation. So don't worry about some character showing up as being Satan. Julius already identified who Satan really is. The great deceiver, Piso himself, his own son, calling his father Satan. Of course, of course, he was because he created the name and the concept Satan. As the British author Thackeray said, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive. And he was absolutely correct. It was a tangled weave, but they practiced to deceive. And they deceived the world, and it has lasted for 2,000 years. Next question. How did you connect Flavius Josephus, the public name, with his real name? That is a complicated process. I devoted a chapter of that proving that In the book Flavius Josephus was, was uh, Arius Calpurnius Piso. I did not cover 100% of the things we've related to. All over the My years. My friend yeah. Doug figured we should give as large a smattering of information as possible yeah. so people would understand as best you can. It's a difficult the, the, proof is, the proof is in the book. But uh, you'll figure out about 90% of what you said. We didn't get into Flavius, uh, to Valeus Paterculus, this connection. This is real for the real, the real scholars. This, this is part is real somebody, scholar if stuff. If you want to go beyond that, uh, we, uh, you write to us and we will try to give you, give yeah. you information on uh, the connection of uh, Valeus Paterculus to it. But we answered the, the idea of uh, the authorship of Mark through four hands, basically. Right. And uh, the, the story is, as some of my friends have called it, uh, it's not only fiction, it's not only, it's not only fraud, it is it is not only a hoax and a swindle, which has been going on for 2,000 years, it is also 2,000 years of mental abuse. Jews have been physically abused, murdered, treated as Satan, uh, stereotyped as, as minions of Satan, of the devil, led to Hitler, a psychopath, a sociopath all because of church teachings for 2,000 years that the Jews were evil. It's all fiction. And they knew it. But he did it. And they did it out of ego. Without his ego. Agreed to. The greatest ego, the greatest writer that the world has ever seen was Arius Calpurnius Piso. 
but without his ego, without all these code systems, without all this trail of breadcrumbs, nobody would ever have known the secret. But of course, the church would not have known, and they have tell, held this secret tightly to their breast, refusing to give it up, not caring what people say, as long as you don't mention the name Piso, and you don't connect Josephus with it, the church will like you, they'll love you, they'll say you're a true Christian. Don't mention the word Piso. That's verboten. That is the bad name you must not my, mention. My Oh, that's right. The, the creator of the church, or organizing of the church, definitely was Proculus, right? Proculus was the original one. Then Antoninus... Maybe that's why they call St. Peter's, Saint Peter's on Cathedral. On this rock I will, you will found your church. Piso intended his son Proculus as his successor, but Proculus died two years after Piso. Fabius Justus remained loyal. He manipulated, he maneuvered, he murdered, he slaughtered, he killed used intrigue, used marriages, and he succeeded. And he died in bed. Right. He died in bed. Well, I'm sure without, no, without any guilt. So, <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the, the sad part of that. Um, okay, we covered the virgin birth. Um, okay, what do you think is the real purpose of the Pisos writing the New Testament? Population control, of course. They wanted to be first to control the, the slaves and poor people and have to pay less, they have to collect low, uh, fewer taxes from the aristocracy. You didn't have to have a soldier at every door. You could scare the heck out of them. They use a religion. A lot of fear and a little bit of hope, just like the Stoics controlled the masses yeah. before the rise of Christianity with, with a combination of fear and hope you could control these poor, illiterate people whom you did not allow citizenship to, you did not allow literacy to, you did not give Bibles or books into their possession, you kept them stupid and illiterate, and as long as you could do that, and it lasted to the 15th century, you could control the masses, even the Renaissance, which was deliberately set up by the church to mollify the masses. They didn't allow them to read in that time in the 1400s, it wasn't until the invention of the, of the um, Gutenberg Bible and the printing press, the 1500s, and the rise of Martin Luther and, the, and uh, reading your Bible, and then the Brits singing the Spanish Armada in 1588, that Western man finally rose from the, Freed from himself. the control and manipulation, hatred and murder imposed by Christianity, all in the name of love and salvation and and kindness. Well, all, all the time, the religious and political leadership all knew the pesos had written it because they were induced to join up. Look at the money. Look at the control. Well, oh, it's the leadership wanted control of, of the masses that control way. Control the masses. Yeah, control the masses. Um, <clears throat> we covered some of the code systems. Uh, Greek large numbering, small numbering, sequence system. That's explained in the booklet. Um, they have cumulative small numbering. There's a whole bunch of code systems. And I don't want to um, beat it to death for people. And it's somewhat, some of it's a little bit complicated. We've mentioned some of it. Did you want to add anything to some of the code systems? I try to make things simple. You have to, yeah. I'm not a classical scholar. I'm an attorney by profession. But I've always believed to try to make things simple for the average person. I wrote it for the average person to understand. Mm. We've sold, Doug sold some, <coughs> I sold a lot, my wife has sold some, friends have sold some. In total, more than 40,000. Never had a person write to me after buying the booklet, and we used to sell them very cheap because we wanted to get maximum mm exposure to a five bucks. the world. It's a responsibility owed to the world, not just to the Jews. Right. The world has been enslaved oh, by this. People have given money thinking they're going to they're going to see Jesus in heaven. There's nobody there in heaven with the name Jesus. Because he never existed. He can't be there in heaven if he never was on earth. If but there's no story. I'd like to add something on that. Invention. <laughs> Piso got the name Jesus from the Greek translation of Joshua. Joshua's father was Nun, 
And that's why a Catholic sister is called nun, N-U-N, spelled the same way. So <laughs> it's kind of funny. But um, it, it, many parts of the story are very circular. Yeah, when he uses a name or something like that, it's always for a reason. Um, I was going to say, which, which, who wrote which books? But I think we'll just cover the main ones rather than all the smaller ones. Like, we know roughly when Mark was written. When was Mark finished by Arius Calpurnius Piso? He, he took over in 70 and wrote his own book, Matthew. It was a name which he gave to his father, Gaius. And then he took it back for the purpose of writing Matthew, by, to honor his father. Yeah. 75 to 80, he wrote a revised uh, gospel of, according to Mark. Yeah, his father's. Right. Yeah. Uh, because his father had finished it, even though um, Vespasian's brother, his grandfather, Furious. Piso's yeah. grandfather, paternal grandfather, um, had uh, written it, had written most of it. Uh, Luke was written 85 to 90. Luke was after the figure, his grandfather, Furious. Piso's grandfather, paternal grandfather, um, had uh, written it, had written most of it. Uh, Luke was written 85 to 90. Luke was after the fictional name of his son Fabius Justus, whose real name was Marcus. We discovered that later. He was Marcian, he was Marcus of Byzantium, named after his great-grandfather, who was Piso's grandfather, who was here. Marcus Calpurnius Piso. I have it up here, yeah. Right. He wrote that, and... Uh, Piso, meanwhile, was, was writing his Jewish war, uh, Bellum Judaicum, which was uh, 75 to 80. And uh, about 90, he wrote Antiquities, or supervised Antiquities. The Herodians wrote most of Antiquities. And uh, about 100, he wrote his Vita, which was a sequel to uh, his Jewish Antiquities to inform the aristocracy of all the numbers. He didn't say what they were, but he put in <laughs> the numbers so they could better understand what he was doing. Because if there was one thing he wanted, it was honor. He was the greatest egotist, the greatest writer, the greatest honor seeker there's ever been. And without him having created all these systems, systems of code, Nobody would have ever figured it out. I think one of his sons even says in a writing uh, how, how many uh, wonderful different writing styles you have. That was Pliny the Younger. Pliny wrote public letters too. Yeah. And in one of those, and we neglected to make a note of which one of the of the public letters it was, he writes to his his uh, grandfather, uh, his uh, his. Uh, his wife's grandfather, who is also his uh, much older half-brother, he says, oh, you write so wonderfully. You write in so many different styles, he says. And he did. He did. And he just loved honor. And he just loved to be praised. And he just loved that his story should last forever. Although he wasn't sure. He wrote, when he wrote Ecclesiastes, vanity, vanity. Yeah, everything is vanity. Everything I see is vanity. Vanity and emptiness. I don't know what will happen to all my life's work. I've worked so hard on my life's work. It may be just thrown out when I, after I die. Who knows? Maybe I've worked for nothing. It's this Ecclesiastes, which the Jews this call is Kohelet, Kohelet, the preacher, is, is a, in effect, it's his confession. Of what he's done. No question about that. He couldn't escape from confessing of what he did. And he wrote Ecclesiastes for that purpose. The greatest writer who ever lived. It was a great, great decision on my part. Until Doug came along, I'd had it for six years. I'd figured out 80, 75, 85% of it. But it's a great responsibility. I used to think, what will all these... Elderly ladies in tennis shoes in California have to believe in if they didn't have this. Let it be, let it be. But Doug and others finally said, look, 
I have an aunt who, who crosses herself when she passes in front of the church. <laughs> you know, look, it's, it's pure faith, and it keeps yeah. people on a moral <laughs> compass. And it's difficult to create as, as, as uh, marvelous a system of this which would support a moral code. Yeah. Only society needs a moral code. So I, I had misgivings for years before I took it upon myself to, to try to spread the word. And I couldn't stop these, these former Jews who were now atheists from running around breaking up Jewish families by talking them into, into uh, Christianity. And they wouldn't listen. The rabbis wouldn't listen because they were afraid. Uh, Christian believers wouldn't listen because they were so content in the arms of Jesus. And who's going to listen? I said to myself, well, the world needs a moral code, but nobody's done it for 2,000 years, and if I don't do it, Jews will continue getting wiped out in pogroms and inquisitions and by Hitlers who are trying to expand their power by using the ideas of Satan against the Jews. And the non-Jewish world will continue mirrored in darkness like some of the British poets have written. And there's no solution. We can shoot rocket ships to the moon. We can clone DNA. We can invent com combust, uh, internal combustion engines. Now we've got computers and the internet. All this stuff. One thing is sacrosanct and it must not be told to the masses. Just the leadership get to know. I said that. Fiddle. I'm not going to going to put up with that. As far as I'm concerned, I know the secret, and I'm not going to sit on it and torture myself. People need to be liberated. There are millions of Christians out there who are used for their money, and they're laughed at behind their back by their leaders. It's time they found out. It's been a tremendous burden for them. They've been used too, just like Jews have. Everybody needs to be liberated from this. I wanted to ask one. Well, we're going to merge to, we've covered almost all the points I had here. The, um, the, the book Enoch, I think he, he first creates the idea and the concept Satan? No, he creates, he refers to the devil and gives him the name Satan what in his know? writings when he sends the angel Gabriel to, to Mary in the story that you will, be, you will be mother to a savior and his name will be Emmanuel. Perhaps they hadn't settled on the name of Jesus yet. I don't know. And then he sends Gabriel again. He comes, either Gabriel or Michael, comes down to see Daniel twice. Very interesting. In what, Daniel, what year was Daniel? 26. About the year, not, about the year, uh, uh, about the year 95. And uh, he comes down to see Daniel. And uh, first time he comes as, as an angel from heaven. And then he comes down as actual Gabriel. And uh, he tells, he tells uh, Daniel, this book sh should be sealed up and hidden until the world is more educated and is ready for that, this information. Another confession by Piso that it's all a fraud. But we can't tell people yet. My story may evaporate in two, three, five hundred years or a thousand years. He had no idea it was going to last for 2,000 years. Okay, he, he created Gabriel earlier than the book Enoch. Oh, yeah. Did he create Michael in the book Enoch then? He has, two, he has two then. I think he created Michael and Gabriel and then put them into the book of Enoch to, the 100. to predate the book of Enoch to establish a foundation for the names of the archangels. Right. Because it's not in the Jewish religion at the, all. It doesn't show the up there at all. Hebrews have no archangels, just None. angels appearing. Correct. And they no one names associated with them. No names, them. names, no names associated with them. No yeah. names. It's not in the Torah. It's not in the Bible. Later in the Talmud, the Jews gave up on that point and they started referring to them and they made up a couple more archangels. So we have five archangels and one of the five archangels has a different name, two different names for him. But that's where the archangel came from. He had to establish an early foundation to show that in the writer, whoever he may have been, and it was himself, the writer uh, had an ancient foundation for the names of archangels because they were named in the writings that, that, uh, that he did of, uh, of Enoch, which is written about 100. 
and backdated to the early days of Jewish history, of Judean history. Does I remember Jesus goes into a cave and sees Satan? Do you remember? In one of the stories? No, I don't, I don't think so. He's up on the mountain. And Satan, uh, oh, and he, I see. he tells Jesus to jump, and Jesus won't jump. Uh, no, the story about uh, the cave is one that's used in uh, in the inception of the Koran. In, in uh, which I, I should yeah. mention right now, for all those Muslims uh, watching this and and gleefully cheering away and say, "Hey, Christianity is a fraud," I'd like to remind you that. Through the entire Quran, the we mentioned through the whole Quran is referring to chapter 2, verse 98 in the Quran, which is Archangel Gabriel Michael, who theoretically dictates the whole Quran to Muhammad, who was illiterate in a cave. You may have three problems here. One, uh, Archangel Gabriel Michael were created by Pisa, they're fictional characters. Uh, and Mohammed was illiterate. How is he going to write this stuff down? So you might have a problem with the story. It's not anybody's fault. Everybody has been used by their church leadership. Well, Everybody. political leadership in this case. We've always been used yeah. by political leadership. <coughs> to control the masses. Through the device of religion. The communists said religion is the opiate of the people. And to an extent that's true. It doesn't mean communism is right. Because that's also a, a, a system of ultimate control. control it's another world. religion. Just it's another religion. The state it's becomes the Catholic God. Catholic Church of the Middle Ages, reborn under the name of Bolshevism, just as the Koran is. It's feudalism, is what and, it is. Uh, our yeah. plea, my plea, is for ecumenism, where everybody should recognize God, or if they don't believe in God, just follow a moral code, mm. be kind to each other, as expressed in our booklet on Islam, which we also have available, uh, the idea that people who love their brother of other religions, of no religions, would be doing the right thing. And that's the only way to have peace in the world. Uh, the, the we final certainly thing, don't need another no. 700 years war. No, we, we don't have 700 Muslims years. <laughs> the, the last thing I want to... Too many horrible weapons in the world today. No. The last thing I want to cover is... Um, is the books that Piso and his relatives wrote and forced the Jews to do the Hebrew translation and put it into the Jewish canon. The reason is, is uh, many um, Messianic uh, Jewish groups, as well as Christian groups who are trying to evangelize Jews, try to point to the, the Piso books uh, to, um, to prove that Jesus fulfilled these ancient prophecies. Now, the ones I know of, are and scholars, uh, there's two Isaiahs, Isaiah 1 and Isaiah 2. Isaiah 2 goes from chapters 40 to 66. The reason why it is 66 chapters is because we said earlier, Flavius Josephus is total 66 in Greek small numbering. The reason he adds 26 chapters is the same reason. You can go tell them. The t well, 10 and the 16. My friend Doug and I disagree on a few things, not on right. the thing. Not on this we one, disagree. Though. I say there were three Isaiahs. He says there were two. Two for sure. We can compromise perhaps on two and a half. But one thing's for sure. He got a hold of Isaiah. He added he stuff. He added all kinds of stuff. And yeah. he definitely added between the end of chapter 42, where the book supposedly ends, up to chapter 66. Mm. He also changed Ezekiel. He also he added, added stuff. to Jeremiah, his son, uh, Justice, after he, his father died in 118, and then he, he murdered his, his brother and the other three consulars. He wrote Micah, he wrote Malachi, put in prophecies of the virgin birth in Nazareth, in Beth, excuse me, Bethlehem. Zechariah. And, and he wrote Zechariah at the end of the Third Jewish Revolt. He Daniel. Just, he just diluted the the Jewish writings to pieces, forced the rabbis at the at the threat of their lives and at the threat of their religion being extinguished to do translations into Hebrew of these books that he had done. He added innumerable prophecies of the coming of Jesus to the existing Jewish 
Uh, he, he, also wrote, he also wrote First Chronicles and the book Job. Job is no question. That's another book that's loved by Christian pastors because it's so Christological. Job and Zechariah and the book of Esther and all of these things were written by the Pisos who wanted to, to supplant Judaism in every possible way and they used this way too by polluting the Jewish writings and changing them around and the Jews were stuck with them. They could not change them because they were afraid that they will be accused of, of changing their Jewish Bible and therefore being against history and they would probably be murdered for that too. The church didn't need many reasons to murder Jews from time to time. No, they were trying they to keep control their people. They were afraid the Jewish leadership knew some of this stuff and they wanted to kill off as many as they could so the secret whenever would die the, with them. Uh, whenever the opportunity came along for 1900 years, yeah. the Jews would be the contempt and hatred accumulated by the... Who wrote Jonah? Jonah was written by, by one of the Pisos too. Uh, Jonah was uh, was uh, written by Fabius Justus, as I recall. And Ruth was written by Pliny the Younger, and these books were forced into the Jewish writings. Yeah, well, they had no choice. They were defeated people. They were defeated people, and they, they were living no only at the sufferance of the Romans. Correct. And they didn't want to be slaughtered a fourth fourth time, as it was half the Jewish population was deliberately uh, cut down to less than half went down to, from eight, over 8 million people in the Roman Empire down to a, about 3.5 million at the end of the Third Revolt. And the Jews gave up and they turned to their own studies and the men went to study in the, day, in the daytime and uh, the women increasingly became um, going to the market and having stalls in the markets when they could, supporting the families and they just, they just lived, lived, just basically lived. and. Uh, until the rise of Islam, they had no place to run away to. Once they were chased out of Rome and you know, out of uh, Spain in 1492, those who could escaped to the to Turkey and helped the Turks build up their their uh, their empire. But Jewish history has been very sad, and they've known it, but they don't like to talk about it. Christian history has been very sad for the average person too. They Most of Europe. From Two thousand years of mind manipulation. Well, the Poles, Poland was converted to Catholicism after they killed 100 or 300,000 of them in battle. Well, they, During the 100 Years' War or the 30 Years' War, one or the other, they slaughtered them. It, it's been a history of, of murder, mass murder of people. Yeah. That's what's kept the population down. Same thing was true for Germany, too. It's yeah. terrible. Hey. Anything war killed uh, 40 million people, 6 million Jews deliberately and uh, another 34 million people who got in the way, including um, millions of, of German soldiers, Russian five, soldiers. Uh, The Germans lost 5 million, as I remember, and the Russians lost 20 and million. This is all because of the use of religion to, uh, to try to conquer other people. Yeah. Did you want anything else? I think we covered I most of it. I think we covered it all. I encourage people to read it. You can order from here. I'll, 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 I'll give you the order. Now, I send uh, uh, a money order to Abelard Reichland Foundation, or Abelard Reichland, P.O. Box 5652D, Kent, Washington, 98064, $17. is $15 for the booklet and $2 for mailing and handling. Please send a money order. So we'll put, we'll put the money orders through a ri uh, as quickly as we can pick them up at the... Sure, and we'll mail them off. We'll mail them off. And we won't have to wait for the, for the checks to clear. Thank you very much.